Good morning um, to those of you here in Austin with us and also for those of you who uh, are joining us via Facebook Live. We are going to be live streaming this panel uh, for some people who are not able to be in attendance today. Um, thank you for very, very much for being a part of this. This panel is on the future of plants and paving and we really want to kind of set up where technology may be taking us into the future. So for the next few minutes we've invited seven panelists to be a part of this conversation and what each one of them is going to do is basically prime, your pump, prime the pump, give you a few things to think about in terms of where we may be going. So they're each going to speak for five minutes. Um, they're going to introduce themselves and tell you specifically what they're talking about, whether it's plant operations, screed operations, all the way down to rollers and connectivity. But we also invite you during this time to participate um, via our Slido. The number, I believe, is J. Well, we, we changed it for this one. Uh, it's actually open on my computer. I think it's J546. J564. Um, so during the course of their um, brief talks, uh, feel free to send in any questions via Slido, um, and we will then be answering those as they come. We will also be doing something slightly different um, with this. Instead of the questions being as moderated as they have been the past two days, you're going to have the opportunity to see all the questions that other people are submitting and like certain questions. So the more likes a question has, the higher it's going to move up in terms of being answered during the course of the panel session. So feel free to also look at what other people are submitting. If you think it's a great question, like it, and it'll help that question rise to the top to be answered. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dennis and we will just move down the line. Um, each panelist will have about five minutes to talk about a different part of plant operations, production, construction. Thank you. I'm Dennis Hunt, Senior Vice President of Gencor Industries. That's my grandfather. He bought his first asphalt plant in 1941. Eventually he owned, our family company owned 50 of them. And I tell people, and I guess first time I went to an asphalt plant, I was 10 months old. My mother took me to have lunch with my dad. So. That was 1957. I've done this for a while. I've seen thousands of asphalt plants. But I tell people, if my grandfather was alive today, and we stood across the street from a plant, he would look at me and say, Denny, you people have done nothing to change that. And I think future, they're going to look the same if you stand across the street. But what I would say to my grandfather, and I say to you, is let's walk up to the plant and let me walk you around and see all the changes that have occurred over the years and that will continue to occur. So let's talk about that. So the road ahead, IIoT 4.0. If you don't know what that is, you should learn that. That's the Industrial Internet of Things. That is the conversion of information technology with operational technology. We kind of talked about some things that go with that. But the smartphone. Could we run your asphalt plant from the smartphone? Well, we can do that today. Would I suggest you do it? Absolutely not. Uh, but could you watch it? Yes. And will there be more information that that plant will bring you? Yes. There's a plant just south of here that is called a smart plant that we have. It's very smart. It talks to things. It knows things. It tells the operator more things than the operator has ever been able to see ever. And you will see more of that rollout as we converge those two things together. Things on the plant that will help it run more efficiently and give you better information. Wrap. If you have more wrap, there are ways to put it in and ways to make it better. Now, I watched a video this week on CNN about carbon neutral concrete. It reinforced to me the view that CNN is fake news. <laughs> there is no such thing as carbon neutral concrete, no matter what they say. Ours is the most environmentally friendly material that you can recycle 100% that gives you that lower concrete, um, environmental footprint, carbon footprint. And there are ways that we continue to improve the plant to make that better. But remember, our process, our product is 100% recyclable. You can't get better than that. Wrap will continue to be important. Its use and the amount that we put in as technology continues to improve on it. The, 
material and the plant. Quality. Quality is the greatest thing there is. It's what we have to sell. Um, and greater things will be put into the plant to help quality, especially information. The plant can see things, maybe moisture online, other things. Technology will improve that. People. We're going to have less people, so we have to make the plant smarter, smart plant, to be able to operate more and do things and tell the operator more information and more skilled operator. The environment. Again, I guess I messed that up with my fake news. Don't listen to the concrete people. That's all I have to say. Our plants are more environmentally friendly and will continue to get that way as we make them a lower carbon footprint. AR and VR kind of goes with the IAOT 4.0. There are ways that we can use AR and VR to help with maintenance, help with operation, and really make that plant run more efficiently. Um, somewhat the future is here. There are things that can be done today, but there will be more that will be done over time that will help the plant run more efficiently at a lower operating cost, but really produce a better product for you and your customer. Um, and hey, I made it within my five minutes. Thank you. I'm Tom Chastain. I'm the milling product manager for Work in America. In the last couple of days, we've talked a lot about communication and production. Okay? Here's the thing about milling. When you communicate, you have asphalt on its way, it puts a milling crew into the mindset, it's time to produce, okay? And we talk, we talk about balancing production. Well, a lot of times what we see is the way milling balances production is we try to overload the trucks without making them look overloaded. That's how we balance production. But where we're going with this is milling's always been the first one out there. And in reality, if milling crew does it right, the pavement crew should be able to sit down at a joint, nail out the street, give it half a crank, and pull off, no problem. It hasn't been that way. So some of the things we've done, and we've implemented on the machines, what you see on the left, what we call performance track. Okay, what performance tracker does allows us to name the job, tell what we're actually cutting, and then basically it gives us an overall job, all the data, as far as quantity, densities, as far as square yards, cubic yards, how many tons we put in each individual truck, how much idle time we have, how much fuel, water, and even tooth consumption we have on that job. So basically when we get done with that job, it goes through the GPS receiver to a server. Within a matter of a couple minutes, you get an email, Excel and PDF form, Gives you all that data, all that information, shows you where you cut. If you had variable depths, shows you all the variable depths in the area that you cut. So that way, instead of driving down the job you just milled with a wheel hanging out the door, now all that data is given to you. What it also does is now, if it, if it also recognizes you're making half a pass, and what it'll do, it'll actually cut off spray bars that you don't need. So it saves on water consumption as well. A lot of people complain about water in the cut. I'm a big fan of water. You know, because water's cheap, teeth are not, unless you're in California. So that, that way allows us to do that. So we get that information. It's all we, that way we've always got it on file. Now, as far as production goes, what we have is, we hit that bill assist, the one on the right, hip plate. Here we go. So mill assist, what we can do now is our feet per minute, our drum speeds always dictated the pattern, the quality of the wrap material, and obviously the pattern. So what we can now do is we can dictate to the machine what drum we're using, whether it be a standard 5 8 fine, micro, whatever the case may be, what teeth we're running, and what quality of pattern we want to achieve. So what we can do, once we tell the machine this, now what we can do is the machine's going to dictate the rest either by slowing or speeding the drum up. That way we have a consistent pattern 
from curb to curb all the way across. I'm done. Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Neeson with RoadTech. I'm a product manager for pavers and material transfer vehicles. My mic is not working. Is the power on? Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Neeson. I'm a product manager for RoadTech. I uh, cover pavers and material transfer vehicles. Today I was asked to talk about material transfer vehicles and where they might be heading in the future. But realistically, to know where these machines will be heading in the future, I think it's important to understand what their history is. So, uh, Originally, these machines were brought into job sites as a rolling silo. The full intent was to have more material on the job site and available for the crew to help them between truckloads. Um, so as road tech moves forward with new material transfer vehicles, uh, the number one thing we feel like we have to pay attention to is the material transfer portion of material transfer vehicles. Uh, now, with that being said, Craig mentioned earlier in his talk that uh, when he started in this industry, if he had gone on a job site and complained about safety, he might have been laughed off the job site. That was true as well when these machines were first brought to the market. Uh, but today's world has obviously changed, and the next thing that we need to pay attention to is the operator experience. Not just safety, but ergonomics and operator comfort and making it a machine that the operator actually wants to use uh, for a long day of on the paving job. So uh, Rotec is really paying attention to not just safety, but overall operator experience and how do we make this machine better for them while they're on the job site. Uh, finally, um, being on the job site is great, but uh, one of the biggest areas we get complaints with these machines is when they're moving between job sites. Getting a, a shuttle buggy 2500 from your yard to the job site or from job site A to job site B, or even just parking on the side of the job between shifts can be a nightmare. Uh, they're big, they're heavy, there's no way to store 25 tons of material on a rolling chassis and not have it be a very big machine. Uh, but paying attention to that shipping envelope and making sure that it is as tight and concise as possible I think is going to be a, a huge step in helping you all better use the machines and, and not dread using the machines as much. Because I know in some instances, unfortunately, people dread using these machines. And anything we can do to uh, make both the owners and the operators more comfortable with having material transfer vehicles on the job site is uh, hopefully going to help your pavements and your company. Bill Lang, and I'm from Volvo Construction Equipment. I'm the product manager for paving and uh, road products, essentially. And I'm here to talk to you about paver-mounted thermal profile. Great. Um, in, in, in where our industry is going, and uh, I hope to get some good dialogue back and forth. Um, and so if somebody out there has run a, PM, or a thermal profile job, please, please ask questions so we can all learn. Um, but I wanted to share with you the definition and just some basics, right? Of what is paver mounted thermal profile? This is straight out of the International Society of Intelligent Construction. And George Chang, Dr. George Chang, he, he had, he's basically the chair of this organization. Um, and it basically, it's, it's a, I'm not going to read it to you, but you see it there, right? Uh, potential thermal profiling for potential thermal segregation. Um, with this, I just wanted to like bring to the scope to you the amount of research and data that's available out there, right? So MinDOT uh, or VoDOT did a nice report that's also on uh, 
that website, IS, ISICF.org. It kind of goes through what they did on their tests, what they proved out, what they learned, all those things that you can look at to learn, right? Um, there is an AsherTo spec, right? PP80, right? The Texas Transportation Institute, they, they did a lot of good work on pavement uh, thermal profile. So I would like to point to that. And then just to show you how this is picking up in our industry is the roadmap that MnDOT, Minnesota Department of Transportation, said that, hey, you know, we're going to go forward with intelligent compaction and thermal profiling, and it's, we're just going forward. We're not going back. So as this technology catches on with the states, as you know, from like the states lead the way. So one state will go, the other state follow, um, there might be some modifications, but I do see this as something that's coming uh, more so in the future. Um, but just quickly on OEM and aftermarket installations. So all the OEMs have some sort of installation, whether it's through an aftermarket kit or something. So there, it is something that's out there that you can mount on your paver. You don't have to buy individual, uh, this brand or this brand. I just wanted to get that clear. Okay. Um, so let's go on and let's kind of look at what what uh, we have here. So this is a picture of a display of a thermal profile picture up in the right. So um, as you can see, this is probably a European job site, which it is. Uh, everything is clean and, and uh, it's basically one of the pavers over uh, that we have over in Europe. Uh, up in the right, you see the thermal profile. It tells you other information too, the speed, right? Uh, how much, where are you sitting in terms of uh, temperature? Are you uh, outside that temperature window? Are you inside that temperature window? Uh, how much, there's other features of the paper, thermal profile in terms of material management. Right? There's a weather station on uh, that you can put on where you can see uh, upcoming weather. Uh, data transfer to the cloud, right? There's a ton of data that, that comes across. And so that leads to another discussion I think that as an industry we need to address is like, where are we going to find the people to get all this done, right? Because it is a different skill set. Anyway, we, as equipment manufacturers, it's our job to make it as simple as possible. All right, so what are we after? We're after thermal segregation, right? That picture up there on the slide shows a thermal segregation. It's pretty good. I mean, there is no really the thermal segregation. Everything is pretty uniform. But if you look at this next slide, you'll see that, yeah, there's some thermal segregation. Uh, that is a pretty good, it's one of the better pictures I could find. And it correlates to this sort of <coughs> premature failure of the roadway. You can kind of see where the segregation is, where the failure is. I thought that was a pretty good slide. The other thing I'd like to talk to show you too is I took this from a report from MnDOT. Uh, it just shows the thermal segregation that you see or the differences uh, on the left from end dumping all the way to using a material transfer vehicle. Uh, it's not a, I'm not trying to plug it use going to to an MTV, but anyway, what it does illustrate is each time your paper stops, there's something right. You're going to see something. Right? Like keeping things moving and keeping things going is the key. Um, and you can see here that on the, the green bar is low segregation, the blue bar is moderate segregation, and the red bar is speed. All right? So that just gives you some ideas of the things that you can look at in, in the data. And of course, there is all kinds of ways you can pull it in and analyze it via beta, uh, which is an intelligent compaction system, um, or any other sort of proprietary type of system. So what we have here is just a small video, and then I think I am done. Looks like we're getting no. Richard, did you click on the little hey this is video? This is just a quick 30 second video. So I'm darn near out of time. Let's see if it goes. If it doesn't well, we got music anyway. Sounds good. Sounds good. Anyway.
No worries, Richard. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Now you have to find it on YouTube and turn it off. It's basically a video of just thermal profile, which actually isn't that exciting. display is, where the GPS is, the thermal camera, uh, those kinds of things. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Henry Polk, and I'm with BOMAG. I'm the asphalt uh, product manager for the asphalt pavers. Um, and I'm going to piggyback or pick up right where, right where Bill left off. And that is the remix technology. All of our manufacturers, or all manufacturers, have some type of, of remix technology, um, reblending technology. We just happen to use a, a, um, a counter rotating twin um, augers inside the hopper. Uh, we want you to consider remixing, reblending that material at the most critical point, and that is right before it hits the street face. Um, this is not new technology. It's been around for many, many years. I think we started the, uh, the very first one came out in 96 or 99. <laughs> but what we've done is we've improved it. It's, it's been a long road. Uh, materials, uh, wear materials, uh, production increases. But with the twin, uh, rep, uh, with the counter rotating delivery augers, coupled with the outboard spreading auger drives, uh, we see great results in all, all of our thermal jobs that are documented across the country. So uh, just take into mind the different, different options you have out there for remixing technologies. That's fast. Quite. <laughs> I think someone will be good. Good. <laughs> My name is VJ Palanisami. I work for Dynapack North America. So, First, I, thanks to Richard, I included as part of this presentation. And when Richard asked us to put together this in, in terms of compaction side, what is, where is the industry going? And I, I, I sat there and looked at, we've been in this business long enough. First, let us understand where did we come from. If you, if you look at this uh, two sides, one is the dirt roller uh, evolution within our own company. This side is the asphalt roller, how it, uh, how it all started. It, they, this is like the 30s and 40s, this is how the asphalt roller looked. Same similarly to the dirt rollers at the time worked. We have come a long way from 30s and 40s to about 70s and 80s and in 2000s and now we are, I would say, leapfrogged about seven, eight uh, generations past in, in, in both, both dirt or asphalt rollers. And every time I looked at it, how long it took to change from one generation to the next generation. Here, it was like 15 to 20 years to change from one generation to the next generation of rollers. Next, it was 10 years. Next, it was like seven years. Now we are almost coming to a point, every four or five years, we are introducing new products or new generations. How was this possible? What is the reason behind it? Is it because of competition? <coughs> is it because of the, we want to increase profitability? Uh, is that the reason? Is the regulation forcing us to change the generation of these rollers? Any guesses? The answer I found was within our own company asking questions with everybody is, you guys, you all, is the reason we are changing the machines so fast and able to develop more faster because you're adapting to the technology more faster than ever. Is that, do you think is the right answer? Yeah. So that is actually one of the biggest reasons every manufacturer is trying to come out with a product way faster and, and much better products because thanks to you, customers and contractors, <coughs> you are adapting the technology much, much faster than ever. Quickly showing what's happening within the roller uh, spectrum in terms of uh, different uh, technologies available. One area is uh, what every manufacturer is trying to uh, concentrate is on the uh, drum technology. We have different kind of compaction, vibration, oscillation, directional, all kinds of technologies available. What they're trying to do is uh, 
how can we get all these technologies put together in one roller? Today you have to buy three different rollers if you want the technologies. What we are trying to uh, look into it, how can we get all this technology into one roller? One roller can do this to you and help you improve your bottom line. The next area is looking at is new drive systems. What kind of drive system can be done? Of higher the power is better the performance is gone. That thinking process long gone, I would say. People are looking at more efficient way of getting things done. And our industry also looking at different ways. A couple of examples I brought here is, uh, one is on the drive system side, a manufacturer already looking into hybrid technology. Basically they're adding an accumulator to the uh, machine. So the, when in a roller operates, when is the most power required is when the vibration switch is on. By the time you hit the vibration button, that is when the most power is needed for a roller. So how can we reduce that power requirement is adding an accumulator when it's not, uh, when the button is uh, not pressed or at the moment, the momentary button pressing, you're able to gain at the non times more power and use it using accumulated technology. But the other way to look at it is, in our company, we looked at it is, for 70 years, 70 plus years, the eccentric was always looked like this, one shape. There was an aha moment from one of our engineers, why the eccentric is shaped this way for 70 years. Just simply by changing the uh, way it, uh, the eccentric is shaped, we were able to gain or reduce half of the power required when you hit the vibration button. A small change led to half the power required. And this is kind of uh, technologies we have both manufacturers are looking at both drive systems can we get a hybrid? Can we go to electric? Can we go to different alternate powers? Also on the driven system side, can we do better to reduce the consumption of power? Another area we are all looking into it is uh, the operator. I would say today's operator is the best time uh, uh, comfort or any safety features ever had in any machines. And that is due to the continuous evolve, evolving of operators, the, the type of operators we had in the past and now and the requirements from the operator they want to be comfortable they want to be more sophisticated they are working on their 10 11 hours in, in a hot environment they want to be at the end of the day when they go back home they don't want to have any more back pains they don't want to have any more uh, issues in their body and we are looking into it very very closely and see how can we make it better for them so some of the technologies came around is how cool is that? It's no longer there's no forward or reverse direction on a roller. There's no definition anymore. When you go forward, it's forward. When you go reverse, it's also forward now because the seat can rotate about 360 degrees. There is no, there is no longer a definition of forward or reverse. They are always looking forward. And uh, things like the today's uh, the operator consoles and everything, it's, it's completely changed. We have most sophisticated information in front of the operator to make decisions. They're no longer relying on some other, somebody else tell them how they did the job. They can see it right there, how they did the job. Also what's happening on the other side is the compaction side. We all been in this room and discussing intelligent compaction and different technologies. Another areas people are exploring is how can I make it automatic? It still it is not completely automated compaction. Machine, you still have to select the aptitude. You select has, still have to put the frequency. You still need, need to know which type of material you are. There are technologies now available. Those all done automatic. One of them was in our company, we invented a seismic. What it is, is uh, in a, in a, on, it is invented on a dirt roller. And what it, what it does is it knows what type of material it is in, what type of uh, thickness it is in, and automatically selects the vibration, amplitude and frequency and controls the whole process. The operator, all, all, all he or she is doing is start the vibration, from there it's taken over by the machine and completes the vibration. As it required, adjusts the vibration technique and completes the job for you. It also exactly tells how much is the compaction values achieved in the process. And, and quickly on the last uh, thing is uh, where the whole uh, compaction industry is going is combine the autonomy with the driving, autonomous driving, you are able to achieve 
completely operatorless uh, machines. There are already a lot of manufacturers looking into it. They have given some how the concept would look like, but the most of the work is done in the area of how can I make the compaction automatic and also the driving automatic. So this is happening right now. If we can figure these two things out completely, we, we can get there in four to five years. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Brian Downing. I'm a global sales consultant for Caterpillar. I uh, actually for asphalt rollers. Um, one of my second jobs is connectivity in the paving space. And so this morning I'm going to talk to you a bit about connectivity of machines, smart iron, what machines have on them um, from an industry perspective. And so we're looking at the needs from any perspective, whether you're in the quarry or you're working on the earth moving side, measuring productivity is a significant piece to this. And so Caterpillar Production Systems is focusing on this. Looking at the industry as a whole, there's a multitude of, of, of things in this suite. Link is machine hours and location. As you can see, many competitors have similar, similar offerings. Uh, payload, this is kind of the foundation of measuring productivity is how much material I'm, am I moving. Again, same situation there. Great control, they degrade space. It has been 2D, now moving to 3D. You know, it, frankly, if you're not moving earth with a 3D system, you're probably behind the times. Um, and then looking at compaction systems, VJ talked a bit about these. There's a multitude of them out there. We do have an automatic compaction system. Um, and then finally command. So this, this is a space where where autonomy is, is set. We've seen a couple of examples on VJ's slide. Um, Caterpillar will launch a soil compactor that is semi-autonomous at Con Expo this year. And so we call that command for compaction and it's basically a method spec based compactor that rolls a rolling pattern based on that method spec. Um, E-routes is what I'm going to talk about next. That's really the connectivity of material delivery. Uh, and then uh, Bill talked about thermal profiling. First quarter of next year, we will also launch a uh, system here as well. But you can see the competitive space here. I'm going to promise I did my best to, to create this, but there are gaps in this as well. Um, I focus mostly on uh, the paving industry. E-routes. Um, what is this solution? It's a material tracking solution. Timing by truck and job. Keeps track of your tonnage. Mobile alerts here as well. It keeps track of trucking performance. Um, you got, at the end of the day, reports that are, are produced by this system as well, as well as archive data. How does this system work? It's geofence based. Um, we start at the hot mix plant, and when a ticket is generated, an electronic form of that is pushed up to the cloud, and that starts the process. Stepping back, so how do you how do you create this job? First, you set up your job like you would any any other. What am I going to do today? How how big is this job? You can manage this by a daily basis or by a total job. And in in the process, when material is generated for that job, it accumulates on that. And so it starts at the hot mix plant with the creation of the electronic ticket, then it ends up at the asphalt paver. As I mentioned, this is an asphalt material delivery solution. But considering everything that I showed on the previous slide, all the payload measuring, you can mag imagine that this solution might be the gateway to many solutions of material movement. And uh, as you all know, there's a lot more than the hot mix that gets moved at, at your plant. And so starting at the hot mix plant, ending up at the paver, uh, the paver, we have two different geofences there. One of them represents the job site, the other represents an en engagement with the paver, and so a dump has taken place. We actually use GPS trackers on the trucks to keep track of this. Uh, this is a two interface system, uh, so it's web-based on the backside with management type reports, and then it's app-based on the ground for the superintendents and the folks on the ground. Um, so this has a daily view toggle switch up in the right-hand corner. 
So you can look at what's happened by the day or you can look at the total production by the job. Dash, the dashboard is what we're looking at here. So next arrival, how much is in that truck um, from the uh, hot mix plant to the job site. I wanna step back here, one, one here and just show this slide here. And so this is in a, the trucking look. So you have loaded marked as green, Blue means that they're on the job site, and once they've interfaced with the paver, they turn gray, and so they would be returning and or going to pick up millings if you're Gallagher Asphalt. Um, and so this is really the, the look from the app and, and what it offers in terms of uh, functionality, all based from cloud information that is packaged in a way that's useful to the paving crews so they can make real-time decisions. And in the last couple of days, I don't know how often I heard real time, but it was very frequent. Um, and, and this solution does allow you to, to look at your process and make improvements. I will guarantee you one thing on this slide it's wrong. Why? Because this space changes rapidly. And uh, so this is a, a number of the competitors and or the offerings in this space and they offer different solutions and, and different, it really features that bring value to your operation. And so this, this is kind of the, uh, the, the space for the third party additions that can bring solutions to process control for you. And that's the end of uh, my presentation. So I, I think we're gonna open it up for, uh, for questions here now. Just a reminder that if you are interested in submitting questions from Slido, um, you can log in uh, slido.com or just Slido on your phone. And the number for this event is J564. Submit questions, like questions, and we will um, answer those as they, they come up. So the first question um, I'm going to give to the group is really focusing on the idea of um, I see an IR and it says, do you think a company needs a dedicated employee to process and monitor I see an IR if you're running these on a daily routine? I'll, uh, I'll take my, my shot at that one. I think the most successful uh, operations are utilizing on the fly analysis of I see data. Um, Bryce spoke yesterday uh, Bryce has, has really was the champion at his business for this and took really being a champion to the next level and, and has created a, he's got a patent pending algorithm where he utilizes various parameters of, of the ambient temperature, mix type, base materials and so forth and takes that to a new level and estimates density on that. And so it's by him being involved as a champion at that level, he, uh, he has been able to, to really execute and produce superior results for, for his company. My opinion is that companies starting out, it, it, the amount of technology is overwhelming. So you need to have at least somebody that's dedicated that can bring you up to speed and spread the knowledge. Uh, it seems to be the best way, in my opinion. If, if not, maybe a super user, but somebody that needs to start you off and then get it rolling from that. Everybody needs a teenager they can bring in and teach them how to do this. Yeah. So. My take is on the same way. It's, it's having one champion helps a lot. Being a super user or champion or uh, person is uh, very much into that uh, focused area. And then that person can train and develop multiple people at the same time. That, that works better than have, starting with more number of people and trying to get them safe to the end game. So. All right, um, any other thoughts on that? Uh, so the next question I wanna ask is, so um, sometimes uh, technologies advance in different parts of the world because of either climate or regulations or just um, initiatives that are being driven by either those countries or the regulating agencies. Are there any technologies that are 
going on or being used in other parts of the world right now that could either improve quality or safety um, that we should be looking at in the U.S. to implement to help us with either of these issues? I'll jump in. Well, one thing is that uh, what we don't like to do here in North America is wide width paving with tamper bar pressure plated screens. Yes, it is a slower process, but when you're getting 92 to 93% free compaction behind the screen and a joint free mat, it goes a long way. The problem we have here is we don't have the space to shut down an entire stretch of interstate, you know, guardrail to guardrail to do these things. So that, that's something that we see in other parts of the world that, that you know, it's, it's wider, slower, but a lot more effective. From the plant standpoint, I've been in the last two months, Kazakhstan, Russia, Sweden, several countries in Europe, visiting customers and plants. The picture I had up there, beautiful fall with the asphalt in Swedish. Uh, in Sweden, they are now running only biofuel at the plant. Natural gas is not considered a friendly fuel. So a lot of environmental is being driven by Europe and others that may or may not affect us at, at some point. It's something you need to think about. From a uh, compaction site, uh, in most countries uh, in Europe, they start with uh, soil, soil compaction. So they believe if the soil compaction is done, intelligent compaction and four technologies, and then the asphalt put on top will also be used by C. So they start with the soil by C and then continue to that. In North America, we be more focused on asphalt and also my, uh, my take would be we also need concern on the soil and the liquid as well to make sure that is done correctly before they need to the asphalt. And on the MTV side, uh, I think it's also ties into a little bit of the next question as well. Uh, there are uh, MTVs out there, uh, like Kyle mentioned, some of the drawbacks of the biggest shuttle buggies and others in job site parking and everywhere. There are MTVs available in, in much more further technologically advanced machines, including a VMake or one in Europe. Now we have introduced in North America, which is track system based, it's not wheel, and it is weights about 30, 30 to 40 percent less weight. So you can park anywhere at the end of the day, finish the job, and park next to it because it's not on big of a tire, it's on tracks. So we can actually park anywhere in the job site also. And also it can be, it's only eight foot six inches wide, so you can transport anywhere also with the job extra permits. And the technology itself there, uh, basically everything is automated in that machine, right from the truck in putting asphalt into the uh, hopper of the MTV, it gives enough, uh, it has enough technology to automate that. Also the, the conveyor is automated and also the whole driving is automated as well. So it's pretty much the operator is doing is uh, the steering machine. That's pretty much is, is done. That one technology I would like to see evolved in, in North America. So uh, stepping back to the safety question here, uh, one of the things that next generation rollers uh, from Caterpillar will have, we'll have radars, we'll have uh, intent, um, the, the ability to detect, we use cameras for operator visibility, but all of these things are fundamental stepping stones to an autonomous roller. An autonomous roller is not going to operate in the space without some form of detection system around it. And uh, looking at the technology we have today, intelligent compassion, a good example of mapping what the roller's done, same principle, principle applies as you look forward. The roller needs a path that path might be a thermal map. You know, that path is going to have some cooling curves tied to it. So it's just thinking out, out of the box and all of, in these spaces um, does create opportunities. Um, fundamentally, first we're gonna step, create a safe work environment uh, for crews today um, with the technology, but these are all stepping stones moving forward. So if we can take a second to go back to the MTV question. Uh, BJ mentioned uh, smaller MTVs that don't include storage. Uh, we'll certainly have those, and, and uh, tracked MTV is available to curb head if uh, particularly low ground pressure is important. But uh, when we focus
focus on material transfer vehicles that include storage, uh, like the shuttle buggies, um, and the question around how can we possibly make it easier to move such a large machine um, to and from job sites. One of the is is the four wheel steer option. Um, so if you get that on your shuttle buggy, then it's it's much easier to make tighter turns. Um, so that's important. But really, um, a bigger step that you'll see from Road Tech soon is is going back to the drawing board and, and placing that 25 ton storage right in the middle, and then uh, getting everything else that goes with the machine as tightly around the storage as we can um, in in a way that makes the full machine envelope smaller, uh, particularly the height uh, is reduced such that um, you know, bridge laws and, and particularly getting under bridges is much easier. Um, there's not really a very good way for us to reduce the width because we still have to receive a truck in front. Uh, and, and unfortunately, our truck drivers can't uh, tend to hit a seven foot opening uh, as much as I wish they could. Um, but um, reducing the weight and reducing the height and, and making the machine more maneuverable when it's on the ground are all parts of our strategy to make the material transport easier. When I look at technology and where it comes from, and what it could do for safety and all that you could. It, you have to kind of look at where all the manufacturing is located. Based in predominantly in the European countries. So if you that that European influence is, is definitely comes into what equipment design and changes. Um, and it, not to scare anybody, but that the we're not gonna do everything that the Europeans do. Um, but one thing I do see is the migration of to a cab. More and more requests for cabs come in. More and more cabs. The open ROPS air uh, uh, era is kind of fading away. So the, those are the, some of the subtle, subtle, subtle changes you'll see over time. Um, just those easy things that I think that'll help with quality and safety in, in terms of operator comfort. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I mean, based on what BJ made a comment, you know, the operators in that seat for 10 to 12 hours a day. Um, what I see overseas in our European models and, and what they're doing overseas is they're really focused on operator comfort, ergonomics, safety. Um, I've even seen air conditioned seats, heated seats, cabs, asphalt pavers with windshield wipers. Um, it's just, uh, it's, I've seen it, I've seen it all. So like you said though, I, I, don't, I don't see it all coming, but it's, yeah. it's definitely going in that direction. And I, I share the opinion that on the whole autonomous compactor is being, hey, everyone wants to strive for it, right? But I just don't see it in the near future. I see it as a journey and it might come one of these days, but I, There'll be some niches out there that, that maybe you want to do some autonomous work, but by and large, our industry is uh, supported by good people that do good work. And I think that's here to stay for, for a good long while. So kind of moving on and thinking about, um, thinking about quality and <clears throat> one important part of a contractor's life is giving the, their owner or their customer the assurance that they delivered on that quality and met the specifications and standards which were asked. And so what do you think it's going to take uh, from, a, from a technology standpoint for us to move into where we can almost start getting real-time product acceptance either at the plant through material quantities and types or out on the roadway instead of kind of the piecemeal system that we have right now of checking in asphalt content, getting a density, and maybe running a TSR a few weeks later. Um, how do we move in that direction? How does the changes in technology allow us to get there? Well, I, th I think at the plant, there are technologies that exist today that if agencies would have faith and confidence in it, and we as an industry too, can start us getting down that and they will develop, again, done the 
this for 45 years. I've watched technology change and change the industry. Uh, and those things will come about. And I think that is a, a way to go, is getting material when we make it is as close to perfect as it can be. So that confidence when it leaves the plant, it is in that shape. Then it is handled throughout the, pro the rest of the process down to where it gets to the job correctly and is laid down and compacted correctly. I think that can happen. I think we've got to think outside the bubble, outside our comfort zone, embrace some of this technology, figure out how to get it all together, utilize it, and work smarter, not harder. Because instead of us doing one, one aspect of road construction the right way, to doing the rest the wrong way, it's counterproductive. So if we can find a way to utilize all this technology and all this information that's there, either from the machine, manufacturer, whatever the case may be, and utilize that information, it's going to make everybody's life much easier. It's going to make the product that much better. I think um, for instant approval uh, to happen, we've talked a lot throughout these meetings about uh, process checklists. I think realistically you would have to have many smaller approvals along the way from uh, you know, showing or passing some sort of test when you're gathering material, when you're blending and, and making asphalt, uh, to when the material gets delivered to the paper and, and ends up going through under a thermal camera. Um, and then after the rollers, I, I think if you wanted an, an instant approval, you would actually have to get approval on each step along the way. Uh, if you ever want to even attempt to get away from really just waiting for a measurement. But the, uh, the tools we, we're talking about here today, and we talked about thermal mapping, we've talked about intelligent compassion, all these tools are a step towards that acceptance. You're validating that the asphalt was laid at a uniform temperature. The intelligent compassion validates a uniform compaction process. Following that, you, could, you would expect that barring some in, inferior sub-base that you would have the densities you're looking for. And fundamentally, this is, I believe, where, where the industry needs to move. Unfortunately, I could probably count on both hands how many contractors have moved this way progressively. Um, most most are, are moving this direction based on push from the agencies and or the owners asking for this information. And so that, that's the thing that I think about is, one, are we bringing enough value as manufacturers to make it a dead on, this is exactly what we need as a contractor. Um, maybe we could argue that, yes and no. Um, but fundamentally, what we're doing is we're just measuring, we're putting our, our baseline in place, so we give you opportunity to look at your process to make corrections, wherever wherever the issues out lie. So, so at Volvo, we, we made the transition from uh, building the equipment and you analyze to, uh, it's our, called our active care direct system, to us accepting, looking at the data and generating reports. And I think that's somewhere we have to move as manufacturers is to be more coupled with the prop contractor in terms of the lay down, uh, offering services and analyzing data and be somewhat of a, quite frankly, instead of an iron company, more sort of services or support company uh, to help the contractor to get that verification. I know that ADI, I would say, part of you to consider also is the workforce development side. The technology is it's there. It's there one form or other. Are we able to quickly embrace the technology? Can all of our uh, people can quickly get onto it, get uh, learn that uh, new way forward and adopt and make it work? I think there's still a disconnect between those two uh, because we try to push technology more and more and there's uh, adoption rate. It's, it's, it's a lot better than 10, 15 years ago. Can it be accelerated? Yes, it can be accelerated much faster as well. We both uh, develop that uh, the workforce side as well to help that go in the right direction. Well, jumping off of that, and be, even though it's not one of the top three questions on the moderator, I can do this. <laughs> one of the questions was, how do you think these changes in technology are going to impact the way the people that we're trying to recruit into the industry. The, 
because from, from my standpoint, um, even just even just looking at my son who doesn't know life without an iPad and he's nine, um, what's that going to mean for the people that we're trying to bring in? Is it going to make us change the, the culture of what who we're looking for or the type of people that I need now as a roller operator versus maybe 10 years ago? I see that as the, the biggest limiting factor in all of this. Where are we gonna get the people that wanna do this? It, it's beyond, it, it is something that is needs to be addressed and developed. Uh, my son, my, my kids, they just, they probably, their interests may lie in somewhere else. And, and I don't see a large base of uh, young people coming into this industry that really want to be part of it. And, uh, it's just, it, it's a concern. If, if, if we as manufacturers keep it simple, bring value, gamify, as mentioned earlier this morning, um, some of these, <laughs> these technologies are somewhat creating competitive opportunities to do better. You're measuring, you can react in real time. All these things allow you to, to just make better decisions on the fly. And with, with the ability to archive this data and store it all, you, you have the ability to measure. And, and you, can, you can actually keep running totals. All right, so now going back to the list of questions. Um, so we, we heard a lot yesterday, we've talked a lot about efficiencies. Um, especially as we're trying to make our plants and our operations more efficient because it's going to be um, better all around. So with raw material costs rising, how are we thinking about plants and equipment helping us reduce or eliminate waste or be more efficient the way that we run our operations and business? We'll start with Dennis. From the, the plant side, you know, my grandfather had a book in the 1950s that told you how to do that, best practices at the plant. And I don't think that's ever changed. Raw materials have always been expensive versus what we sold our product for. So we've always been trying to eliminate waste. The key to eliminating waste at the plant is proper timing and proper calibration. So many times I go to plants around the world and I see those two things not done correctly. And so a lot of it comes back to management and operations working together to make sure that that plant is operating as it was designed. And waste can be dramatically eliminated. I haven't been to a plant that couldn't do a little bit better on waste. Um, are there things that could be done to the plant going forward? Potentially, but I don't know. But there are ways to minimize your waste right now. DJ talked about switching and mixes. That's where a lot of waste comes from. Better planning, better execution helps that. I think uh, as far as the milling side goes, I mean, when it comes to wrap material, uh, a lot of people have many, uh, we won't call them piles, we'll call them mountains. We need to utilize more of this wrap material. Asphalt is 100% recycled, right? I mean, we've always said that. We need to figure out how many different ways we can utilize this wrap material to our benefit. And whether it be coal mix, you know, war mix, whatever the case is, we gotta learn how to utilize this wrap material. And when the milling process I say you can size it exactly, but you can't get the sizing down to where you can utilize this more efficiently. Every every time this paver stops, it's a hit on efficiency. So how do you embrace some sort of technology or couple the link to the plant so you never run out? Your paver's completely running all the time. That that's a good good noble endeavor to figure out. To connect that their technologies that are coming on board connected site or whatnot that can help in those those endeavors you said it three times connectivity <laughs> i think connected solutions is one way of uh, reducing downtime and waste and, and it's been tried and, and a lot of people are coming in that arena uh, very fast reason is uh, once you know exactly where the material is, once you know what's happening in the plant, standing in, in front of paper, you can react faster. And unless we connect the plants, paving and trucking, and 
also the compaction behind it and the QC. Once we start connecting this and a job site foreman has that in front of uh, uh, in front of the foreman, all the data is available. Where is my truck? Where is my what is my paver doing? What is the roller doing? All in one place. Then it makes a uh, lot of things makes easy. Reduce the downtime in cooling the material. Reduce the downtime on trucks. Can I optimize my paving speed? Expecting where my trucks are going to be in the next 30, 40 minutes. Can I optimize my number of rollers I have on the job site and how, how quickly does the job has to get done? And I think connected uh, solution is one of one of the things that's going to evolve quickly to make uh, to solve a lot of problems uh, in, in very quick near future. All right, so we've got about five, a little under five minutes left in this, and so I, I like. I want to end with this question and we're going to kind of elevator speech it. So 30 seconds, each one of you, I'd like to try to answer this question. No pressure. We've had a lot of talk about technology that's either available right now or kind of on the cusp of what, what we can do or what may be coming. What's the next big thing? What's the next big thing that you see that can change either the way the industry functions as a business, the way we operate, the way we make our, our asphalt mixtures or the way we lay them down, what's going to disrupt us and make us think about how we are as an industry that's coming? I think from the plant side, environmental. We have got to be environmentally friendly and fit into neighborhoods, areas that we're in, and be better neighbors. Utilization of uh, infrared technology to see how the pattern is on the machine and dictate the machine speed from that point on. Uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit here and say that the biggest disruptor to our industry is going to be the autonomous vehicles that are using our roadways. Uh, if we don't figure out a way to work with them and, and hope to get some uh, variants and wheel paths, I think we can see massive disruption to our roadways due to excessive wear just in the wheel paths. And that's, that's something we're going to have to figure out how to deal with if we can't get the technological side from Google or, or Uber or whoever to, you know, to help us there. My belief is the people. We need to recruit, retain good people that can create a beehive of activity that we can really understand what is going on in at the job site, create new technologies, and bring it from the ground up. Uh, that is why I believe it's the most critical you know, game changer for us if we can recruit those people, get them on into our uh, industry. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, recruiting those people, advertising those, the, the technologies, the benefits, um, the, the careers, uh, great careers that can be made in the road building industry, and convincing. Uh, teaching the younger crowd coming up that it, road building is it is a great job. I love it. I love being out on the roadside and uh, I love being out there on the job site. And we just need to uh, uh, grab that generation of, of, of folks coming up the line and, and, and promote that technology and marry the two together and uh, move forward. In my point of view, uh, it is the autonomous job site, which is, uh, I happen to see in the mining site, as part of the mining industry, I happen to see there, and I think we're slowly progressing uh, towards the autonomous job site, and that I would see that happen in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I'll close up with a similar comment, and I guess it, it does come back to autonomy. Um, Autonomy on the roads, not necessarily from a job site perspective, but going bigger than that to uh, passenger cars and so forth. And, and if you were to even think bigger than that, if what happens if there's no longer wheels on the road? Um, and I, I don't think that's that far-fetched of an idea, but at some point in time, it maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, and so it, we definitely do need to deal with transportation modes and if that happens to change and it's not axles on the road um, this this is an entirely different space and that might take a hundred years or not um, so it's a rapidly adapting 
space and, and technology, you know, as we look at it today, is going to be different in 10 years, guaranteed. Um, and, and so really just looking at that from our equipment standpoint, automation for sure, we need to automate everything, just make it easier. If labor is our number one concern of our contractors, we have to have systems that adapt and are, are interesting for operators that, that they want to do it and they can do their job well. Um, gamification is a good example of that. Um, so just, just a couple of random thoughts there. It, as bold as no cars on the road versus, versus uh, autonomous cars everywhere and uh, autonomous job sites. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming and being a part of this with us today. I, I appreciate your thoughts and um, kind of the insight where we think some of this is going, where it may impact us in the future. So, thank you all. All right. all right, for those of you who are looking at the schedule and realize that the wrap up says it's from 12.30 to 1, don't worry. Um, I do just want to kind of have a couple closing remarks as we, we leave today. And um, the point of this conference was really to try to give practical takeaway information that you could take back to your jobs, to your companies, to your plants, to your crews, and, and make an impact on performance. Because as Napa, and we talk to DOTs and we talk to our customers, that's what they want more than anything else right now. They want us to put down something that's high quality that's going to perform. We've heard over the past few days that we've got those tools. Sometimes we just got to take the lock off the toolbox to remember they're in there. And so hopefully we encourage you to do that over the last day and a half. Um, I appreciate the, the comments that have been given on, I appreciate the, the quality of the speakers coming in, being a part of this today. Um, thank you to the other NAPA staff, um, Liz and Casey, you helped set up the event. Joseph, Brett, and Carter, who were here helping with logistics as well. Um, you heard people talking about technology. You heard people talking about challenge with workforce, uh, shameless plug, come to Maui. And those are going to be two of the big things we're talking about there, is how is technology going to be impacting us? And what does the future of highways look like? And how do we innovate in a world that doesn't want us to innovate? Um, and how do we reach this new generation of people coming in. And Napa has spent a lot of time and effort over this past year developing and testing messages to figure out how do we get people interested in our workforce? And those are gonna be two of the, some of the highlights of the meeting in Maui. Again, don't just come for the island, come for the content, come for the networking and be a part of that. We thank you um, for this chance to, for your time, um, your effort these past few days. And if there's anything we can do for you in Napa, please do not hesitate to reach out to me um, or our team. We're here for you. We want to support you. Thank you, and I hope you had a good conference. <laughs>